two camps, in my opinion, are important. And there's always has been and there always will be a massive clash between blah, blah, exploitative, screw GTO, GTO, screw exploitative. Whereas the best players, quite frankly, mix a hybrid of the both and they always will. What's up, guys? This is Pete, and we are back with the Carrot Poker Podcast. This is episode 98, I think. We'll correct that later if it's not. Henry Lister is joining us, fellow Run It Once coach. Henry, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Pete. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on. I've been looking forward to, to getting you on for a while because some of the guys in my group were like, oh, get Henry Lister on. He's like really great at, at talking through hands. And I think like your big strength as a coach is just you can communicate ideas in a way that people follow, you know, without without being too simplistic and without being too complex. I think it's a it's a rare talent. It's a good sweet spot to hit. So, yeah, I, I can agree with that. I can agree with that. I think there's a lot of coaches out there who make good content for elite players, and I think I actually think that the essential kind of market and run at once is a bit of a weird like no man's land because you're not dealing with like total beginners are you that you would like coach privately maybe and but you're also not dealing with like really successful players yet there's a kind of it's a strange place to strange kind of audience to pitch to i think sometimes no it's it's definitely a weird one just because what i find is um you know it's also awkward somewhat for me and potentially some of the guys at the essential because we now actually do play sort of similar if not even higher stakes than a lot of the guys that are elite coaches on there so i mostly play higher than the guys most of the elite coaches but i'm i'm not really again i prefer from a coaching standpoint you know doing more simpler based videos i prefer just doing lower to mid stakes and going through hands in a bit more layman terms um, and I don't really enjoy, you know, doing videos just running through Pio Sims and getting ridiculously detailed. And so, you know, I, I actually think I'm very suited for the essential range um, in terms of from a coaching standpoint. And um, yeah, I do get really good feedback on that as a result. So, yeah, it's it's definitely done a lot. I know it's done a lot for my game, like that kind of work, like because you feel like coaching and just talking about the game in general has helped you progress. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I actually probably nowadays most of my sort of I guess studying per se if you want to sort of put it into that when I'm not grinding but I'm trying to get better I actually would say that is mostly via discussion now um, and that's because you know when you play in a lot of different games from different rate structures from anywhere from heads up through to six handed with antis or straddles and because of you're playing on so many different different types of games and pools meta populations and node locks are going to shift from population to population so you know there's just so much exploitative adjustment and games and gto pyo based strategies changing from pool to pool that i play in that running pyo and just trying to be a technical god isn't actually the only sort of way of studying so most of my study actually now comes from just having to think through hands and discuss them from like peer to peer um with other smart guys that i uh, play um coach or stake so most of my actual study is discussion yeah i think when you reach that level where you kind of understand the main themes that are going on in a pyo sim you have to ask at a point like yeah. how much am i gaining okay. by really diving super deep into this rather than taking the theme and deviating in the most relevant way are there any um you talked about meta pools and reads and population trends differing from place to place and that makes sense are there any sort of standardized ones that you think people could people listening to this could take advantage of a bit more um in common spots mundane spots perhaps yeah i'd say there's sort of what i could think of is um let me think um i'd say the main ones for if you're an online player and you're playing in the most in the more open competitive based pools so i mean any pools really it could be like poker stars it could be ignition it could, yeah, Poker Stars, Ignition, I can see to be the main general sites that most people play on. But if you're playing on sort of these pools, 
you know, if it's anywhere from 25, any Zoom stake, I mean, I'm not sure about, I guess, under 25 Zoom, you know, like micro specifically, but quite frankly, you shouldn't be studying an overall um, game plan on how to beat the micros. It's sort of pointless. It's sort of like, you know, you should just learn how to play poker and you'll automatically be winning anyway at like the 25 Zoom level. Yeah. So the overall meta pool that I can explain is population generally under bluffs a significant number of overall spots um, compared to Pio. So you should actually be not looking to bluff catch as liberally as a Pio sim would, which means you should actually be correctly being a bit of a knit and knit folding in a lot of spots where you could argue, oh, what Pio wants to call is 50%. Well, your opponent isn't finding it's going to be on average based on mass data overfolding, oh, sorry, under bluffing this spot. So you should just be net folding. Um, similarly, there's quite a few spots where it gets a bit more of a gray zone, but some people are overfolding. So you should actually be quite aggressive. So generally, people overcall and, and station too much in spots they should net fold, but they also under bluff yeah. in spots where they should be bluffing significantly more. So. Um, when you start to look at a lot of the higher crushers at uh, the higher stakes and their red lines are potentially a bit more upward sloping as opposed to negative, mm -hmm. they're, they're generally bluffing quite a lot and they're being very aggressive. But then it's not like they're check calling and bluff catching really liberally. The red line's gone up as a result of aggression tendencies as opposed to station tendencies. And this is, I think, where a lot of the population gets it wrong and they try to maybe flatten out the red line by stationing more when they should just be more aggressive with some bluffs and... Mm -hmm. some some parts of their like value range and more accurate as well right like the more you find that really good third part block in the river with like your sort of 72 percent starting equity hands or just like I'm, I'm making up numbers here but hands are quite good but not crushing and if you're always checking them to a pool that's under bluffing right your red line is going to tank because you're just winning blue line instead exactly. and that's symptomatic of, of something going wrong there probably yeah yeah i'd like i do i do think though that what is important is you know, if there's something that I have also um, realized over the, over the many years is it also doesn't matter if your red line is up, break even or down. Um, it really doesn't matter. You can be crushing uh, and there have been many guys that are all different kinds of lines. So if you're winning and at whatever games you're doing and you're winning quite comfortably and your red line or whatever, like your non-showdown winning is losing, don't be worried by that. That is actually fine. Um, but like generally speaking the the leaks from my experience come when you have a very extreme set of lines so like if your red line is tanking abysmally then you're probably over folding in spots that you maybe should be calling sometimes you're probably not bluffing mandatory bluff spots you're probably missing the thin block bet for value on the river instead you've turned it into a check fold or a check call when it generates more EV as like a block call or a block fold um that kind of stuff so so yeah, I'm not really saying red lines down start going crazy, but you know, there's lines do say something to an extent. Yeah. Um I find that students I take on that are playing twenty five and L typically fit into two camps, like either their red line is tamping um tanking or their blue line is barely getting off the ground and like both of those are probably um undesirable. And I feel like yeah. it's so hard to find that that accuracy sweet spot in the middle where and i think i think one of the big problems with that is this idea of like pool does x like when the read is so general and people are just saying but they don't bluff but they don't fold and you they're not engaging with the specific specifics of a spot i feel like that's a problem are there any spots in your opinion that are over bluffed and people should actually be calling more to help their red line and, and what would a couple of those be yeah so i'd say and again this is quite this just comes down to good thinking is if you're sort of you know as long as you're not against someone who's an absolute killer and by killer i mean probably the top brags at like 500 zoom or 200 zoom um and i can sort of say this because although i don't really grind that much on stars or like i don't really have much experience at 500 zoom um one of the guys that i've staked now for a year he plays primarily exclusively 500 zoom with a bit of like one sometimes 2k reg tables so like i do have a still have a lot of experience at least coaching in these games so i have sort of got a grasp of what the overall meta is like at 500z and from um some sort of what i'm gathering is people are still just the, the simplest way to often um sort of think should i be bluff catching 
light or not here on a certain river spot is just look at what they naturally are probably going to be getting to that spot with. And I say this because let's say you're in a three bet pot or whatever and the guy's tripled and you know it's probably a spot where you're like okay he was one thirded range on the flop a ton of backdoor flush draws and a ton of straight draws start appearing on the turn and then all of those brick by the river you, that's just going to be a spot where if you've obviously got like let's say the board let's say you had top pair on the flop um let's say it's like ace xx on the flop the turn brings an abundance of straight draws and flush draws and then they brick by the river you're obviously just never going to be looking to exploitatively um fold like the ASEX because it's so damn easy for your opponent to naturally find the right quota of bluffs if they're to be game theory optimal. So it's way more likely that they're going to be either bluffing moderately or over bluffing. Even if you have them down as some kind of nittier opponent or you say to yourself, oh, no one three bet triples as a bluff in these zoom pools and whatever. And even though, yes, they generally probably more under bluff, in like a three bet pot triple bow situation and blasting off all in on the river because people just you know they're playing with scared money a lot of the time it's a spot where like it's going to be very board dependent on how many natural hands can they quite easily just triple off um the problem arises in which i'm more inclined to overfold is if it's a spot where they've maybe got to just triple off like naked blockers yep. to find the bluff and then they've maybe got to be somewhat creative because you have to be a, a higher intelligence reg to understand this is a good triple barrel bluff because we have two blockers to top pair. We unblock the bricked flush draws and the backdoor flush draws and all the straight draws. So this is just a hand that's going to block his call, call, call range and unblock his call, call folding range, make it high be triple barrel bluff. And I find that even at like 500 zoom, but especially, I mean, again, from, from the hands that I've seen from um, the guy that I coach, in these games um like they, pe people just are going to be under bluffing those general spots and over bluffing the general spots where it's easy to find the quote of bluff so you know if my advice would be put yourself in your opponent's position and think what would my range be if i was in his shoes do i find enough bluffs do i struggle to find enough bluffs if i was triple barreling in his shoes if you do then you probably were more inclined to overfold um and vice versa if you think, oh, I could have a ton of all these gutters and straight draws and plus draws that can just triple off quite easily here. So that would be my biggest advice. Just think, what can he have that can take this line? And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong um, in poker. They might just be like, I've got to call this because I'm here in my range and whatever. And both are important, but balance out the two things. Don't just go down one camp of, I've always got to call him at the top of my range, or he has all these potential bluffs. For, find a, a balance between the two weight the two variables yeah and don't be too specific either because people sometimes as far as i coach the game there's two sides of bluffing there's arrival on a node with a certain amount of potential bluff combos and then there's um pulling the trigger frequency or execution you could say yes and people get far too caught up on the execution which as an average will balance out right you know if you're dealing with an unknown reg his stats may be representative of thousands and thousands of different guys some of whom will pull the trigger often and some of whom won't um but overall the trigger pulling frequency will be something reasonable it won't be close to zero it won't be close to 100 and so the amount of combos you land with on that spot on that river to begin with that could bluff i, I just agree 100 percent, and that's why i coach every day that defines the bluffing range more than anything else i actually think every one of my students is sitting listening to you right now being like is this just pete talking with henry like because it sounds exactly the same way i coach like the the bluff catching note i couldn't agree more um awesome yeah because the thing is as well in my opinion like on the turn it's not the case that because you have a gut shot and no showdown value that you must bluff the turn and in some cases, you should check back certain combos like that at a fair frequency. But do you think that people arrive on that river with so many, like more candidate bluffs, in fact, that they should have in some cases? And that maybe makes it even harder to keep the bluff frequency in line on those nodes. I 100%. Um, I think we're in sort of, a, it's, a, it's, it's also weird because it also depends um, on where you're playing. So... For example, if you're playing in day in, day out, 500 Zoom, and that's your only game, and you just play against a small player pool of regs, 
then you probably have you're gonna have more value by playing more gto and understanding situations like oh i'm only meant to roll and bow this gut shot a certain percentage of the time or else if i just always run every gut shot as you sort of suggested here the problem means that you're just going to be open to having way too many potential bluffs on the river but it also means you're bluffing too much on the turn these two things if a reg is available to understand this can now check raise you more aggressively on that turn and punish you because you're going to bet for too much on the turn or it means that you know he can just call you down three streets and call all your bluff catches because you're over bluffing on the river and so this is important if you're against extremely high level intelligence players that are taking a lot of notes and you're playing against them a lot Essentially, it's going to have to be a small player pool, so like 500 zoom or like 2k reg. But, you know, if you're playing at like 100 zoom, even 200 zoom, I'd say, um, and then even, it doesn't matter what stakes. You could be playing at 10k, 5k, 10k, any any like nosebleeds. If you're playing them in situations where the games are anonymous, it doesn't really matter in, in, in terms of, you know, whether or not you're sort of over or under bluffing a spot. Because if the person isn't, doesn't, isn't able to know who you are, then they're not able to technically exploit the fact that you're oh he's always barreling the term with his gut shots here because they they just they've got to play it readless against pool so you're actually in that situation then sort of suggested to simplify it and arguably just over bluff every spot that everyone overfolds and under bluff every spot where everyone overcalls um because they can't re-exploit you as it's anonymous so there's so many strategies, in my opinion, in poker in today's games because there's so many different types of games. If you're playing sort of smaller player pools against known players, balance is more important from a defensive mechanism to not get, essentially, let your opponents attack you and generate EV that way. But if you're in either bigger pools, softer pools, so they're just not smart enough to try and exploit you, or you're in anonymous pools, and this can even, this can be a lot bigger games as well, as I've suggested. Your, your strategy shouldn't be based on defensive, i.e., oh, I need to make sure I bet this coin to pi at X percentage of the time, or else my opponent can technically counter-exploit me in future here by just always check-raising. You, you, you're sort of more incentivized to just sort of simplify and play your hands in a vacuum and just try and take a high EV line as opposed to balancing it. So, you know, I think there's a variety of... I think all of them are quite important. I think that's a fantastic point. And people need to understand as well that a solver is not going to mix unless it's indifferent to EV. And just because a solver is indifferent exactly. to EV in some spot doesn't mean that you are. You're very unlikely to be. There's the um, blades of grass in the garden analogy. It's like one of the wacky ones I, I tell students and sort of say to them, I'm going to guess there's 1,711 blades of grass in your garden. What are the odds I'm you know, right about that? And they're like, well, very low. But then if I just estimate a range of blades of grass, I'm, I'm more likely to be correct. So Pio, when the EV is indifferent, it's because its opponent has exactly 1,711 blades of grass in that garden, right? It's a very precise number of blades of grass. Otherwise, it wouldn't be indifferent. So when you're in a real life situation, what the hell are the odds that that pool is playing in such a way that there is no EV difference between bet and check? None. It's basically zero, right? It's going to be better to either bet or it's going to be better to either check in most spots. And if you're playing on ignition, try and figure out which it is if you can. If you're really not sure and you don't, you want to take away like some decision fatigue, sure, roll for it, maybe. But if you can figure it out, you know, figure it out. And as Henry says, maximize your EV because you don't get any dollars for perfect frequencies. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, basically it just comes down to like, the way that I look at it is, look, Pio is great. It gives you a good overall understanding of how you should probably sort of play the game. It gives you the guidelines, right? And then you sort of, you, you know, if you're in game and you're sort of there and you're going, this is, Pio would probably like just pure bet this because it's just so much better than all the other options. The, pr the probability is if it's a pure in Pio, you're probably going to want to just do what that is for that reason because you're going to need very large exploitative adjustments, i.e. node locks in Pio, for your opponent strategy to be change so much for it to go from being that pure bet to some kind of mix or pure check. So if it's clear, then you do it. When there's a lot of close decisions in Pio, most decisions, may I add, are mixed and close, what you're going to find is when you add in the exploitative adjustments, that's going to push it from some kind of mix to one or the other, as you've sort of said. 
And this is, I think, the problem with most poker players nowadays is they lie too heavily, in my opinion, on one camp or the other. The first camp is don't need Pio, don't need theory. Um, and that's because they've got, and they can win like that because they're smart, they're intelligent, and they understand, they can work it out and with all the node locks naturally in their head that this is probably the best EV play. Fair enough. And then you've got the guys that aren't as maybe as naturally intelligent, can't work it out as well, and they think you should just follow Pio. But the problem is that's too hard. You're not going to memorize everything. You're going to get frequencies wrong. And again, it's not going to maximize EV when you can't, sort of can't mix, you know, between the two camps. So the two camps, in my opinion, are important. And there's always has been and there always will be a massive clash between blah, blah, exploitative, screw GTO, GTO, screw exploitative. Whereas the best players, quite frankly, mix a hybrid of the both and they always will. Yeah, we have a channel, sub channel in our Discord group called Fuck Non-GTO. Um, and it kind of implies that there's a lot wrong with fuck GTO but at the same time I'd like to think that we don't force people to to learn frequencies or anything like that because at the end of the day a frequency is a luxury being able to mix is a luxury because EV is close it's not something you do for the hell of it yeah yeah good points yeah but th and then I, ha I do think it's also important to also know that like again I play a lot of live poker um, when there's no quarantine I do do a lot of live poker and as soon as, if you're playing, as I've said, anonymous sites, or you're playing like live poker, the amount of exploitative adjustments to make away from Pio is a lot greater, even great. I mean, it's still a lot, but there's even more exploitative adjustments to make in those games than there are, at, let's say 200, 500 zoom. So it becomes even more important to really understand the exploitative adjustments. Yep. And again, I'm not saying FGTO, I'm not saying F no GTO. I'm sort of in that situation, it's sort of like, You've come up with a framework of strategies which is sort of based off gto and what this can and can't do but then you know if i know my opponent is a massive whale he's a millionaire in a live game um if i jam 10k on the river into 10k and i know he's calling 70 percent of his range i'm never gonna bluff anything because i'm indifferent my bluff catches well my bluff catches will my bluffs will just become zero ev so i'm just gonna jam it with all thin value and value and he's just and i'm just gonna print um, and this situation's come up a lot more often than they should. Um, and again, being balanced in those spots is going to be leaving most of the value on the table. Yeah, this is kind of a separate point, but it really bugs me when people say, if you're trying to pull off that strategy of frequencies, you won't get those frequencies right and you'll lose a ton of EV. It's like, you won't actually lose any EV, you'll just be arbitrarily trying to do something that's not that important to do in the first place, right? Like you don't, lose ev by getting frequencies wrong and in different spots you like that like you're saying there you can bluff never and you have the same ev as if you bluff always in that situation you might simplify your strategy because it's easier to play and it's lower variance or it's better for your sanity or it's better for your mental game but there's no magical way that you suddenly go broke because you did 58 percent instead of 13 percent in an indifferent spot the fact that it's mixed in the first place yeah. means you can't make yeah. a mistake theoretically speaking so then it just becomes yeah I mean, as long as it's mixed right it, it prior then yes i agree um yep. the, yeah i just i just think there's sometimes i think people put too much emphasis on different things in poker um and not enough players put emphasis on a variety of different things as i've sort of said like you know theory awesome exploitative adjustments awesome but people just normally get so obsessed within one avenue and that's in my opinion where they screw up is that based on like the tribal tendencies of humans pick a side and fight for it yeah it is and the fact is i think everyone naturally if i could if if they could improve in poker i would say let go of your ego let go of saying this is right this is wrong you know it's the same thing i don't want to go down it potentially too much but i'm thinking like the same similarity is like looking at like religion for example like this is right this one's wrong it's just like look look, look how about you just keep your mind open to all ideas and possibilities and you might pick up something new you know you might be like wow i could go crazy and just bluff like mad here even though i really shouldn't mm -hmm. because apio tells me to but once you start thinking about it maybe you crack the numbers you realize in a certain spot it prints to do so so you're gonna do it just just because pio doesn't give you the thumbs up doesn't mean you can't do it or do it more than pio suggests if it makes you more money why would you not do it um, and I think people are just too, like, yeah, they're too straight arrowed in poker, and they're like, this is how we play. We follow the sim. 
look, if you're playing primarily 1K, 2K red games, day in, day out, three-handed against the same two guys, then it's like, okay, you probably do need to be somewhat balanced. Most people, I assume, listening to this podcast right now are probably not, and they're probably not planning on, you know, so depends on what you want to do but yeah balance in my opinion isn't as important as just taking high ev scenario situations yeah and roots in the game tree and people mm. should know as well that when someone like myself or, or like henry uses pio we're not using it because we want to be balanced we're not aiming for balance at all we're just aiming to understand what the highest ev range configuration is in equilibrium so that we have a blueprint that we can base all of our exploits from and that's why it's just super dumb when people are arguing like exploitative is right no gto is right it's like it's like arguing like whether we should spend money on health or on education like both 100%. to some extent That's the way of putting it. It's yeah. like squabbling ministers and in, in the back benches or something but also the thing i'd also like to add is it's like how is when you know it's when people try to do this without any kind of theoretical understanding say i'm going to exploit this person doing this yeah and i'm going but how can you exploit if you haven't got a framework to deviate from? Exactly. You know, like you need both. You need both. Learn how to technically play poker from a somewhat, you know, baseline. Then when you get really sick, then you can start deviating. The problem that I've got from what I hear is most, you've either got some people that are just very intellectual, quite nerdy, that just love the technical aspects of poker and see it as a challenge to try and copy it. And they're so obsessed with it mm -hmm. that they just end up losing their own rational ability and thought, mm -hmm. which should be, you know, if you get to a river and you're going, oh, pie, bluff this 80%, I've rolled an 80. Shit, I've got to, I've got to go <laughs> all in. But you know that the guy's a 70 V pit whale with $5 million and he doesn't fold at bottom pair in from previous hands against a triple bet on a three bet pot. Then you're just lighting money on fire and you're just being stupid. Um, but similarly, you know, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to exploit this person by doing this when it's just like, but you don't even know how to like, you don't know the baseline strategy. How can you be saying this is an exploit? Because you don't even know what you're exploiting, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, I think both are very, very crucial. Um, and I, I, I'd hope a lot of people in this can pick up something from this because they probably lean, most of your viewers probably lean one way too much or the other. Most people don't balance the two thoughts yep. or schools of thought correctly, in my opinion. 100%. I think there's um it's a very it's very much like a kind of plague at the moment where people are extremely obsessed with solvers as like kind of a fallout of the days before solvers existed like it's so black and white like before solvers you had people making up ranges in equilab making up ranges in poker stove he calls the flop with every single combo of a nine then on the turn he folds every single combo of a nine like it just gets super silly and sometimes I'll have students in the Discord group post a hand and say something like, my pool reads tell me that his range is all jack x at this spot and all fuss. And it's just like, okay, so you've just assumed he has all of these hands at 100%, these hands at 0%. You've no idea, like you were saying, Henry, you've no idea what the the general base range should be. or Because the thing is as well, the average reg's base range that he shows up within a spot will be closer to Pio's base range probably than some extreme read specific clairvoyant version of it you've concocted in your head, right? So you need to kind of have that baseline even when you're hand reading. Um, I don't know if your students ever try and make up ranges in an Equilab program or something, but that that really does my head and I can't, I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully not, because uh, like um, most of the guys that I work with, um, I straight away give them an abundance of material with ranges and syllabuses and i'm like right study this for the next couple of months yeah. and then i can look at getting you staked and you can hopefully then slowly move up the stakes yeah. um so i have a pretty rigorous sort of coaching mechanism with all the guys that i stake and coach so thankfully that doesn't happen mm -hmm. or else yeah um can definitely can definitely understand you know all of these errors because I, i've made them because um over the i don't know the sev first several few years of sort of playing poker in my career like i i made all the mistakes you can make um because i didn't just like get staked i didn't get a coach so i did it the slow and the long grueling way which meant that like thankfully i've made all the mistakes in the book which means when i see someone doing a ridiculous bluff catch a ridiculous bluff a nitty fold going crazy in every spot i'm like I i've gone i've gone through all those motions 
You know, I've gone from being a maniac that just blasts off to being a guy that just never bluffs and being a nit. So I've, I've, see, I've done all the mistakes that I can see here and also sort of psychologically relate to people and that I'm coaching and being like, right, this is your probably your mental league because I've been in this spot before and how to overcome it. And so many of these mind blocks are actually caused by, would you say, people's emotions firing more strongly in some directions than in others and kind of misrepresenting oh, the game tree? Without a doubt. Um, I mean, look, if, if, if you're on the river, it doesn't doesn't matter technically how much the monetary amount is because it's relative to each individual but like let's say you're i don't know you're a young kid and whatever 200 quid is a lot of money to you that's very reasonable um then you could just be in a spot you know you're taking your first shot at 200 zoom put 200 bucks in you've three bet bet the flop bet the turn you get to a river spot emotionally you're thinking let's say the pot's 100 you've got 100 behind you know you could be thinking you know if, if it was me, obviously, in that game, because I played that game for many years, and 100 isn't going to change my life for the better or the worse, it's not going to do anything, thankfully, then I'm just going to be able to go, okay, what do I think is the best play here? Do I think this is a profitable all-in? You know? And if I do, I'll go for it. If I won't, I won't. There's not really any emotional attachment to it. Let's say you're shot-taking. That's quite a significant amount of money to you or whatever. Well, then, you know, you're probably go you might be going, oh, I probably should do it and then you might just check and look, every, uh, most people have probably gone through this at some stage you might be shot taking or you just um, or you maybe emotionally felt very uncomfortable about going all in everyone's done that but they force it and the problem and that itself is a leak you know being emotional in this spot and then you've got complete opposite guys guys have no disregard to money maybe because they're degenerate gamblers maybe because they've they've got they're just rich and conversely they might just get to the go ah oh, fuck it mm -hmm. i'm all in so it is very easy to be at both ends of the spectrum you know uh so yeah i, I definitely do think there's an emotional um thing within poker you know um th there's something to say about you know let's say you're playing some high stakes poker and you get to the river and you're like should i bluff this yeah and then you're like it's just the correct decision and you're sort of just like it's a bit like sailor v you're just like it is what it is if they call they call the money's gone whatever it's the right decision next hand let's go and to have that sort of mentality, which is completely not results orientated, when 99.99% of the population outside of poker, I'm talking, just people are extremely results orientated. You know, like my point is, you, you see people that complain, oh, it's raining today. Oh, it's going to change all my plans and whatever. You know, imagine having that kind of mentality, which is probably what my mentality was like when I was younger, you know, just like any normal human being your emotions get flipped by the sm biggest by the smallest of things in comparison and then imagine going oh yeah well i lost 20k at the tables today because you know i had to, but you know i made all the right decisions all good thumbs up i'll get back on it again tomorrow you know like completely crazy because one of them is just basically emotionally affected by the smallest things whereas the other person is just like good day lost a ton of money but good day because i made good decisions yeah and you're factoring your overall um welfare and your overall mental happiness on not the financial results on a short-term basis obviously mid to long term is very different but you're doing it based on your actual decisions and that's not based on the the inevitable instant results it's based on you working it out and going back and just working it out and going based on the information i had this was the best play and it will make me the most money in the long term um, and to, to try and get that level of conviction is just very difficult um i improving every year every day but my god it is a tough thing to do of course yeah i was i was gonna say i'm glad you added that last part at the end because i was thinking like you're describing like a you a mental utopia right now like the kind of finish line that everyone wants to get to but of course it's a grueling journey isn't it um of course what kind of things had did you have to implement what changes did you implement and what mental game work did you do to to get you closer to that that goal of pure objectivity yeah, I'd, I'd, I mean, I've got quite a lot of advice for this. I'd say there's sort of two main streams. Um, well, there's probably three. The third, okay, so the first one is probably just like, it is just based on financials, and this is just the rationale part of your brain. You know, if if you're in a situ, if you're putting yourself in a situation where you're playing 200 Zoom and you can't imagine what would happen if you lost, let's say, 5K, well, then you shouldn't even be playing 200 Zoom. 
you know you're not rolled for it so but first of all play games that you're rolled for you know so you can plan for what happens if you run the bottom so percent of being unlucky you know that's the first thing the second so you don't put yourself into situations where variants can technically screw you over the second thing would be um you just got to rationalize it you know if you're playing day in day out then it's just like it's just eventually you're just going to think to yourself what's the point of being upset if i whenever i have a losing session or i have a bit like a financially what's the point because you're basically then setting yourself up for mental failure if you rationalize it because you're going to lose let's say you lost 40 to 50 percent of your sessions which is probably going to happen i don't know the exact percentage but it's probably going to be somewhere around 45 percent of sessions you lose and you win 55 or and depending on how big a winner or loser you are how long your sessions are those numbers can skew a few percentage of course but like if that's the case and you're grinding let's say you're grinding six days six or seven days a week it can vary from grinder to grinder but if that's the case that's most of the year and then you know that's nearly half the days you're losing so you know that that means you're basically saying you know half of the year nearly you're just going to be depressed miserable upset not in a good mood because of something that's inevitable with your profession sort of like saying i want to be a professional swimmer but i'm afraid of water it's <laughs> a good analogy it, <clears throat> it really is it's it's something which it's it's not it might happen it, it's inevitable you're going to have losing days it's inevitable you're going to have downswings so you shouldn't fear them which is what most people in poker even professionals at the higher level do you should just be like it's inevitable like what's the point i get very angry and upset sometimes if i make big blunders but that's different because that's on me because i shouldn't be making them you know if i have the right knowledge and if i have i then work out why and i don't do it again but, you know something that's without of your control what's the point it's again it's like it's like crying if it rains that's not within your control it's not within your control that you lost the 90 10 as a 90 percent favorite there it sucks but how can you get angry or upset for something that's completely without of your control that's going to happen a lot it's it's literally it's a waste of mental and emotional energy um and then i'd say probably the third thing that i would do is just focus a lot on balance within your life so don't try and focus on getting your dopamine, your happiness, and you know all your serotonin levels boosted up via via the wins within poker, because that basically makes you a gambler and a degen probably a degenerate gambler that's going to try and gain his happiness and get all of this kind of you know feeling good from winning, which isn't going to happen every day. As I've said, if you're a professional player or any player, it's not going to happen every day. So you're setting yourself up again to then be upset a lot of the time. Instead, get your happiness and your fulfillment external from the tables you know i've got a good good obviously i've got a good relationship with my family good lots of many good really close great friends um i take care of my mental and physical health i'll make sure i have designated downtime after this i'll probably have some food watch a film and chill get some good sleep go for a long walk tomorrow before i grind you know if when the gym's open i'll lift some weights and go for a run in there go out when there's no lockdown because of corona go out for drinks or food the point is get your serotonin your dopamine and all that stuff fulfilled off the tables it, and it can be anything whatever it is if you want to play fifa play fifa but you know like make sure you're looking after your mental and physical health off the tables as opposed to looking for i really better have a winning session tomorrow and getting your dopamine that way and i think that's where a lot of people elite professional non-professional whatever are getting the mistake from um Obviously, the difference with non-professionals is they probably are paying poker not for financial benefit as much, but more for the dopamine, much the fun. So it's arguably a bit of a contradiction, what I just said, for a, for a recreational player. But for a professional, they shouldn't be doing it for the same reasons as the recreational. So everything I've said sort of stands true. Yeah, and it's okay to have a preference for something. It's unavoidable to feel pleased when your flush draw that you jammed the turn with gets there in the river after you got called. This, we're not saying be robotic and be like doesn't matter don't care not happy about that but mm. certainly don't take validation from that and especially don't take exactly. don't as henry says brilliant point don't rely on it to boost the levels of dopamine and such that you should be getting from the things that humans evolved to get those things from which are interaction and fun and not gambling because gambling didn't exist back then when we evolved and that's why we're so terrible at it mentally that's why we're wired so poorly for it we didn't have to deal with this volatility. So many good points in that. Wow, like I don't even know where to start unpacking it. Like, 
I think the part about degenerates is so true. Like, if somebody is behaving in that way, they are just a degenerate. And I think that people misunderstand the word degenerate. I think you used it very well there. I think some people think, I'm not a degenerate. A degenerate is someone who can't pay the rent because they were playing poker or who is untrustworthy or lies about gambling or plays roulette or goes to the bookies every day. But in reality, a degenerate is somebody who relies on a certain kind of validation that imbalances their life in order to get by. And poker players do that. I've taught amateur poker players who play 10 and L who are 100% degenerates. They have good bankroll management, but they are emotional poker degenerates because their mood is solely dependent on how well they've done that week. And not just their mood, but their sense of validation and self-worth in their poker career and in how things are going. I'll say to a student, how's it going this week? James, just to pick up a name, who knows? And James will say, ah, oh, rubbish, no, it's not been very good. It's been really terrible. I'll say, well, well, why is that? Well, I was a downswing and then just like, and everything is hinging on whether he's winning. And the next week, things are really clicking, yeah. you know, and then the graph's up like 12 buy-ins and things coincidentally are clicking when the graph's up 12 buy-ins, really. It's a bit of a coincidence. Yeah. So yeah, people need to detect can, this. Yeah. I mean, I can resonate a lot with it because, I mean, I, I, I used to be quite like that. So again, like I said, like I like to think the reason why I've got a good grasp on a lot of things within poker on terms of balance and I, from a coach perspective, mentally and technically, is because I've gone through it all and so I am speaking from experience when I speak on all this. You know, I used to suffer a lot with mental health, anxiety, and depression because I used to be exactly like this with poker. It, I used to be like, yes, I won one money to do. And it emotionally sort of ruined me. And it got me to the point where I was like, look, I need to find a way to do this properly or I can't do this forever. And that's when I, you know, and it's not like I just woke up the next day and I was like, yay doesn't affect me anymore look it still affects me and it always will but it doesn't now affect me to the point where i'm just like you know i've had a losing day today i mean i'm feeling terrible you know like today i ran actually very bad technically at the tables but it doesn't affect me i made good decisions i put in the volume i wanted to you know it's all chill but it's and yeah it's just you've got to just consistently try and learn to tweak your brain because essentially we've got like a monkey brain you know, we've got like two brains. We've got one brain, which is quite rational and we can sort of, you know, we can teach it things. We can try and rationalize with that part of the brain. And then we've got like a monkey brain. You know, a monkey brain is like the one that doesn't really care about reason and it's emotional. And you need to more not try and rationalize that kind of brain, but you need to try and nurture it. And that's where like, you know, if you're going, it's fine. Let's just play the PS5 or go out for drinks with friends or watch a movie, get some nice food, get some sleep, go for a walk that will take care of that emotional side of your brain and then you can rationalize a lot better with the other one that's why you know after a very bad session you might feel so angry and pissed off mm -hmm. you have a good sleep and you relax you wake up the next day and you're sort of like you can start to you know look back and go oh, i played the session though pretty well i feel good to go again you know otherwise you're going to have accumulated tell aren't you if you let that build and build and don't sort of detox that um emotional brain as well i think some people make the mistake of holding it to the same standards that they hold the rational brain perhaps by not making that distinction oh yeah you can't yeah like don't fight the um, i call i call it the monkey brain i think there's i can't remember which text but i've definitely read text in the past and yet basically they refer to like the emotional brain as monkey brain but like essentially you can't rationalize with this part of your brain you can't hold it to account it's emotional it's the thing that you know that enjoys having a beer or enjoys having the gin and tonic enjoys watching the movies sitting down going out with the girlfriend or whatever it enjoys those aspects and you need to essentially bargain with the uh, the monkey brain the, the emotional brain and rationalize with the rational brain and people often especially poker players because we're very technical often very intelligent iq wise we try and consistently rationalize with it all and go yeah, but we instead of going and spending those hours watching Netflix or going out with the friends or going and exercising, we could run a few more sims. We could put in another 2,000 hands. And, you know, you, you can't do that because eventually you just get burnt out. Yeah. Um, and your, emotion, your emotional side of you will just become somewhat neurotic, you know? Yeah. And part of self-worth as well is making sure that it's not just derived from things that are out with your control. Like if it comes from the session 
going well and you're on cloud nine and you're like yeah and you're staring at your session graph and you're posting a hand yeah. on one and you're posting the graph and you're like you know guys small sample i know but look at these 8k hands you're, you're just <laughs> so yeah you're just feeding <laughs> that aren't you you're feeding that whole yeah failure to separate the two brains um it's something i was very bad at when i first started playing poker and it's actually something that like actually two things kind of like stalled my poker career back in like 2014 one was i discovered gto and solvers for the first time and butchered the use of them horrendously and the other was that yeah. all of my self-worth came from trying to understand solvers and become that gto player when i wasn't actually ready to do so i hadn't actually understood how to use them and it was a it was a real meltdown um and so yeah i get what you're saying like you've been there i think everyone who's made anything out of poker as a career has been there at some point we've all been in that situation and none of us have just you know sun run our way to victory and never had any strife um can you recall any moments in your career when poker was really like harming you and you were harming yourself through it and where you sort of realized that you had to change your ways yeah so i can't remember the exact date i, I would guess it would have been around early 2018 i'm guessing it was early 2018 that was only three years ago would it have been maybe it was early, it might have been early, it was early 2019 i realized this um and yeah so basically what it was was early 2019 up for a year up till now so early earlier 2018 up until um, early 2019 so basically two years ago starting three years ago for that one year i was working for gsa capital a hedge fund from home in london and i basically like graded us um stock reports etc and whether or not to buy to sell for hedge fund that kind of stuff and i did that from like midday to 9 p.m however during what i also did was i often got up early in the morning grinded studied poker up until the 12 did that till nine and then afterwards i would also do poker and then probably get six hours sleep a night maybe five hours and then saturday sunday i'll just go hard and just straight up ham and just all out the poker so mm, i basically just worked my ass off um and i was playing poker before this full time but i was sort of i was doing okay but the hedge fund was just a great opportunity so i thought you know what, I'll, I'll take this up and if the poker with this does really well for the next year and i financially go up and everything and i feel in a good position i'm then going to be like okay i can leave this behind i don't have to worry about my cv being what would have previously been empty because i just didn't want my cv to be empty coming out of university i wanted to be able to at least have something to show for it so that was the point of the hedge fund great to just have on the cv once i knew Bogue was going well end of early 2020 I was like, all right, done, I'm out, peace. Um, sorry, early 2019. But by this time, I was so results orientated with the poker. I had crippling anxiety and depression, which probably wasn't helped by the fact that I was working seven days a week all day for about over a year. So that was probably more to do with that than the poker itself. Um, but yeah, because of that, I basically had to take close to all of 2019 not off off but like i did mostly a lot of traveling i went to thailand for i think three months um i went to i think marrakesh cyprus the states i went to a lot of places um and just tried to enjoy life a bit more try and get back my mental health even my physical health and try and play a bit and i played a bit of live poker traveling whilst doing all this and a bit online when i was in thailand but but yeah basically yeah I needed to start to get my dopamine elsewhere um, and that's what I focused on in 2019 and then I'd say since then I've been a lot better um, 2020 was easily uh, out of the last six I, think, I guess it's probably six seven years I played poker now out of the last six years um, last year was by far the worst I've ever ran in my career and that was over a 12 month stint sorry not last year 2019 was yeah so 2019 yeah it was just horrendous as well so i was taking that year off and i also had the nut year of running bad um but that was a testament because i realized if i can get through this in this mental situation running like this and come out the other side and go i still don't want to get a null nine to five and go back to that rat race rat race yeah. poker's for me and ironically last year was then my best year by a long shot and it started off strong this year so 
you know, it, the way that I look at it is it's like, if you can, when you're running horrendous in poker, go, I prefer this over a normal job, yeah. poker's for you. But, you know, a lot, it's easy to love poker when you're running pure. Try when you're running in the nut worst yeah. um, and you're doing that for a 12 month period. It's not easy. And people underestimate variance as well because the, the human brain just, Ooh, it's, overdone, yeah. it's just so not equipped our minds to deal with these levels of, of variance. Like in my book, Poker yeah. Therapy, I sort of talk about the fact that if this amount of variance existed in the real world, like absurdly crazy oh. swingy things would be happening to you every day. Like I'd be trying to talk to you right now and like I would just like fall on the floor and smash my head off the desk and start bleeding. Like things like that would be happening all the time and we'd be equipped for these crazy twists and turns, but of course we're not. Um, what would you say to someone like, well, well, what was your journey understanding variants? Like before that year where you ran terribly in 2019, did you think you understood variants and maybe you'd just not been exposed to the, the brutality of it yet? No, I, I didn't. I had no idea and understanding of variants. I, I can see that now in hindsight. Um, but like, and yeah, but then it makes me think for the, I don't know, the first year or so of my career, maybe I ran quite well. And if I didn't run as well there and maybe have made up a bit of capital, I would I have quit poker? And so so many what ifs, and I'm not sure. Yeah. Like now, without a doubt, I'm very comfortable that my EV is just very strong and there's no threat or worry to that. You know, and I, I'm not really worried, especially if I just keep working hard, communicating, networking, getting into good games, expanding business. I'm not concerned about it now. But back then, you look back and you go, wow, I was terrible poker. Yeah, everyone else was absolutely terrible as well. But like, was I, how did I run good or bad? I, mm -hmm. I, and it's hard to know. Um, so yeah, it, it's a weird one. Um, and it, it does remind me because there were some 200 Zoom regs I used to speak to back in 2019, 18. And, you know, some of them were winning marginally and they were saying, yeah, but I'm running terribly. Um, and then, you know, they went on to get absolutely wrecked yep. and go bankrupt yep. and lose everything. And I sort of tried to warn them. I was like, I don't think you're running bad. And they weren't. They were running hot yep. and they were winning at 1BB. So as soon as they went yep. to normality after several years, they ended up having like a negative 4BB win rate was their true win rate. And that's the point. People, it's very easy. If you want to believe you're running bad, you can just say, I'm running bad backed off no mathematical data you can just say i think i am but the react the reaction is that's probably them wishful thinking and their emotional slash monkey brain you know just going no i'm a good or it's probably more their ego yeah. just going no i'm a good player yeah. um and, and quite frankly you know i don't know I, i'm pretty crap as a player i'd say but like I, i'm better than probably the vast majority of people that in poker and you know i do play high stakes online every day comfortably and that's because i think i'm better than them and i'm going to keep improving and that's the important thing as long as you just keep improving step forwards yeah. you're just going to become better don't don't waste energy on complaining about running bad running under ev getting sucked out on look why not just focus on the stuff within your control and i'm not saying i don't do that everyone does it to an extent but the point is you should try and limit the amount of just whining and complaining because that's energy that you could productively put to use elsewhere like trying to work out how could i have maybe played this hand better from an ev standpoint and then you go ah maybe i should have probably have done this and you can do that by discussing with people or looking in pio and then go, okay, cool, I've learned something. I'm now a better poker player by 1%. Yeah. And you keep doing that every day over the next year, you're gonna be a completely transformed player over 365 days. And putting this all together, I think it ties in a lot with what you were saying about where we seek dopamine. Because put it this way, right? If there's a, an infant, a child who's grown up in a horrific environment where he feels really, really unsafe and insecure and unvalidated, are they gonna be curious? Are they gonna be able to go off and like explore creatively? probably not because all the energy spent just surviving right just making sure they don't die that they're okay oh, yeah. that they survive exactly so in poker if you're one of these people who is not okay out with the game and needs the game to validate them through winning you're putting yourself in a very precarious position where you can actually function unless that game hands you um 
good variance and then you're liable to just be variance as bitch permanently like if you're in that cycle of being like yeah i won these two months i lost these two months and you're overreacting to all of that how can you be objective how can you be curious how can you be that child that's free to explore and free to to grow if you're constantly insecure in your life and like you were talking about henry with everything you went through in 2019 there's a lot of people like coach are in that same boat but they pretend it's okay they think that because poker made them feel good one day it's like it's like the methadone it keeps them going right it's like enough of a fix that they don't sort it things got really bad for you to the point where you had to actually make changes external to poker and now you've come back to poker i believe you fully that you've ran much better this year than last year but you're also in a way better place and you're making better ev decisions and you're learning more because you're more curious and less insecure um so sort yourself exactly. out externally and then you'll be able to thrive in poker if poker's providing your i'm okayness it will also just wreck you at the same time like guaranteed because we're talking years being different we're talking 500k hands being different from the next 500k hands just to clarify yeah. for people we're not talking about 10k of run bad we're talking about a year being far worse than another year Dude. oh yeah without a doubt like um I mean, the easiest way is if you go to like Google and you like just search like a poker variance calculator, you can find them, plug in the figures from your database and you will be shocked, um, quite frankly. Um, and you know, yeah, like it's just ridiculous how sort of scary the variance is. But again, you've also got to tell yourself like if there wasn't this variance in the game, would these terrible players who you know you have an edge against, would they be playing against you? I don't I no, don't recall because... there being a Magnus Carlsen versus Daniel Negreanu chess match for it's twenty thousand games. I mean, you might be dug and you might have, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity when, you know, Daniel Negreanu, who's a big dog, decides to basically give you a million dollars for free for just playing some poker against him. You might get that because of he's got so much money and and an overwhelmingly large ego. But very rarely someone is going to play you if they know that they're basically going to lose. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's two reasons that it normally happens within poker why you're able to play and have an edge. The other people, you know, what sometimes they're just there because for a gamble. They know that it's negative EV, but it's like the same reason they're playing roulette or slot machines. They're doing it for purely entertainment reasons. So they're doing it for a different reason to fun. Um, sorry, to, to make financial long-term money. They are thinking it's, it's it's exciting, it's gamble. They're doing it for the dopamine. Completely different reason for you and what we've been talking about and this, and that's fine. And then they're doing it for a different reason. You know, it's like, it's the equivalent of them of going and buying a movie ticket. They're going to, and they're going to go and do off a bag at the casino. They, they literally are loving it. They love to do it, and that's what they're going to do. And that's how, you know, you make money in live poker a lot of the time with these recreationals doing this. And then you've got, you know, the naive semi-pros or pros sort of weaker regs who think they're a lot better than they are and that's because they ran good over their sample yep. um but they don't realize and it if they're a live player it can take five years to realize this yep. because he is you're playing such little volume but you know i've played millions of, on million i don't even know how many databases i've gone through but i probably played at least four million hands in total on, on stars i'd say maybe less maybe four million everywhere probably but i've played millions on millions for sure and you're playing all day every day for many years so and like when i've done that i've gone through all the big the biggest upswings you can recognize had the biggest downswings had the biggest amounts of running over and under ev like yeah. you know if someone hasn't shown me a downswing or an upswing in which they just demolish win or lose a hundred binds like that yeah. even in no limit holding six max I'm not listening because I've seen it all. <laughs> totally. I wish I knew that. Like in 2010, I like, this is when I first started my career and I absolutely sun ran like unbelievably. And I just like climbed up all the stakes really quickly and played maybe like 600,000 hands that year and just crushed. And everyone was like, whoa, this guy's great. Like he's going to be the next big thing in the community I was in at the time. It was like flop yeah. turn river back in the day. <laughs> yeah, and I had some well. good flares and they were like, this guy's like a prodigy. And then like a couple of years later, um, I just couldn't win and I was coaching because my son run had allowed me to become a coach and I was teaching all these people all the shit about plug in made up ranges into poker stove and see what the equity becomes and this was before Pio and I was telling people yeah. pool never bluffs oh, this no, spot no. and now it's a spot that's like massively over bluffed and I can see that clearly and I was taking people's money and teaching them for years and then I realized I sucked and I still had to coach and I was 
I realized that I sucked. I was like, oh shit, I'm actually quite bad at this game, but I've got all these students. And so I just like forced myself to learn through teaching. And then eventually like, thank God, like Pyo started clicking and I started to understand like the raw mechanics of GTO. But like, see back in the day, Henry, when exploitative poker was the only thing, I was like pretty terrible. I had good intuitions, but my theory was nothing. And like some guys had figured the theory out a bit on their own and I really hadn't. And I was recommending all this trash. Yeah. And then now it's like- Because back then, before hmm. like Pyo was a massive thing, the crushers basically constructed like, this is the bluffing range, this is- So they basically calculated what Pyo would suggest, but using intuition and intelligence. Yeah. You know, like they'd write on pen and paper, you know, and be like, so these are the bluffs, mm -hmm. bluffing range, this is the value bearing range, this is the check fault. They, they worked out those ranges, whereas to, to most people, they didn't really have a range. They were just like, bet. Yep. Got top pair. Bet, bet, bet. Protection. It was, Gotta get it was protection. Flush draws. Like these were the kind of things that I was teaching people. And then it's like, holy shit. Like, yeah. it's like one day you have an epiphany and do you agree with this that everything starts to click like a domino effect and suddenly it all just snaps into focus and you see the objectivity of the game for what it is and it's like a wow but moment. I, I think the big the biggest turning point which is and that and it sounds like it happened with you it's ha it happened with me was it was ego you just you work you go wow i'm actually not that good at this game yeah <laughs> and as soon as you you sort of can say that to yourself You've now just opened up your mind to do everything I said at the beginning of the podcast, which is then open to hearing exploitative ideas. Whereas previously you would have gone wrong school of thought, mm. don't listen, yep. not good. Or you would have gone, that guy's not as good as poker as me, not interested. <laughs> and the funny, and as soon as you start doing that and you get, you know, you act a bit all like up on your throne, you don't want to hear what you've got to say. You're either a worse poker player, you've made less than me, whatever. Like you can easily come up with some kind of validation reason for why that it's not worth listening or taking on what they've said. Yeah. You're right, they're wrong, they haven't played as long as you, they haven't made as much as you, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, even if they're, you know, they maybe have some leaks in their theory or they're not as good at poker overall as you, their point might actually hold some relevant weighting, you know? And just because, and you might go, actually, oh, I think this might be, a, it has, you might go, hmm, it's not like so important to, that like I'm always going to take it into consideration, but like some of the times what that's what they've just said might actually make some sense against some opponents or in some certain spots. And just because the person hasn't made as much as you, or maybe you're playing 500 Z and they're playing 100 Z, doesn't mean they haven't already got some very good parts of their game. It just means they haven't got there yet, i.e., they haven't got the money, or maybe they've got better areas of their game. Some areas of their game or how they view the game as better than you, you just look at the overall game better. So, you know, understand that poker isn't as simple as just like, I'm a better poker player. You know, it's sort of like saying, I'm a better footballer, which you might be overall, but the other guy's got a much better free kit. Yep. You could learn something from them. Totally. It's like in chess, when I play chess sometimes and some opponent, oh, his opening theory is like so terrible and his positional sense is so wrong and he's basically given me a winning position after about 16 moves uh -huh. and i'll be like great i'm winning and then he'll just hit me with this barrage of tactical shit that i would never see and i'm like oh that's yeah. why he's the same grading as me even though he plays the opening like shit he's amazing tactically. it's not as simple as better and worse right. it's not that simple and you see it in poker all the time um but people but the problem is people have an ego and it's the same with other things like with chess like what's going to prevent you becoming a better chess player your ego because you're like you've already dismissed the guy because you're going oh he sucks mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. you know so you whereas a good player will go all oh, right but he did this really good thing so you know never put yourself above a pedestal or someone else and think i'm better than you always try and think what can you learn here how can you be better and always just strive to be better and that's this is what i love about poker as well it's it's built me into being a lot better of a person because in order to come better at poker as i've said you've got to try and stay calm stay not get affected too much by the variance you know get your dopamine elsewhere and not be results orientated and just try and listen to ideas that might help you become a better player it's the same thing with life you know you can have an opinion you can you should be confident and you should execute it just like within poker but you should always at least be opening to hearing other ideas and thoughts about life or anything in general and so this is why i also think poker just 
it's the best teacher that I've ever had for life. Better than my degree, better than school, better than edu any education. Like the stuff that indirectly poker has taught me to be, it's, it's invaluable. Absolutely, because we learn by exploring and experiencing and trial and error. That's how we get good at things is the sort of deliberate practice and constant honing and no book or course is, is going to tell you that poker will test you to the absolute limits. Um, but if you can survive all of that, like you said, Henry, you know, poker was for you because you still wanted it more than anything else, even having been put through all of that and you've come out better for it. I think that's a really, I think the title of this podcast should probably just be like, get your del get your dopamine elsewhere. I think that's a great catchphrase and it's been, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a, good, a good way to think about it. It's a good one. Yeah. I strongly vouch for that yeah, one. It's, yeah. It's a good philosophy. And, and again, don't get me wrong, like all of these things are always going to be works in progress. Don't get me wrong. If, if I've shipped a, if I've just got smacked in a 20k pot against a whale, I, I do feel it. I might, I might scream to my, my guys in my stable and be like, oh, this is some bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, and then five minutes later, I'll just go, oh, well, back, back on we go. You know, I might, I might go to the toilet, come back and be like, all right, let's go again. I love how the, the absolute Henry Lister, like, biggest meltdown, most outward explosion of anger is, this is some bullshit. <laughs> this is some bullshit. I mean, yeah, that was, that, I mean, to be fair, I'm probably not that bad anymore, but, oh, God. I mean, I don't really think I've never done anything terrible. Like, I know you get people that are like, oh, I broke mouse and this and that. I don't, I've never broken, like, a mouse or headphones or, I've never broken anything. Mm. Um, but, like, I think, it, for me, it just ended up. It's not the fact that I didn't get angry. It was more the fact that it became inbuilt anger, if that makes sense, which led to like anxiety and depression yeah. because it just it boiled my blood and I had no understanding how to no release outlet. it. And you either have to release it or not get your let your blood get boiled. Yeah, <laughs> I've always been a, a blood boiler, but I've always been very good at releasing it in a way that doesn't cause much harm to anyone else what? and mainly just hurts walls and tables. I did punch myself in the face once because. I knew the spot was really under bluffed. We didn't use that word back then, <laughs> but I called anyway because I was a degenerate fish and decided, right, I've had enough of this shit for myself. I've had enough of this and just oh, whacked I've, myself I've, in the I've face. experienced that. I was really sore as well because I didn't really hold back and I was sat there, a stack down, looking at a set with a bruised face that I'd done to myself. And that was a turning point for sure. But what's your, what's your, um, <laughs> what's the most like, just before we wrap up, what's like the most tilted you have ever been in po in a poker session, and like why, and like how did it transpire? Honestly, I can't, I, I can't think of like exact moments for me because again, it's not like I've thrown monitors out the window or whatever. You mean that's not normal like, to like attack yourself all the time? Is that is that not like just what people do? Oh, okay, shit. Uh, like maybe I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe in your circles. <laughs> no, fortunately it was just <laughs> but the once, know, but like... it certainly felt like. Um, outward tilting is good in some ways, but I think not tilting is even better, as you describe it, or barely tilting. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it's for me, it's just it just made me feel so shit. You know, like I had, I, but I've always been the type of person because of sort of things that happened when I was younger and upbringing. Um, you know, like I've always like it's like I've always been good at just dealing with stuff internally myself. And the problem that it, or I was just bad at releasing things and showing how I really felt. And this was probably became a problem because it just meant that like, I was feeling terrible from this. But like, imagine if that anger and frustration that built up in you, you just, you just held on to it. Yeah. You had no understanding of realizing how to release it. I fucking had that. Yeah, man. And that led to mental sort of breakdown for many years um, until I started to resolve it properly and understand how to get the proper balance. Because I still was like, look, I'm, can do in poker i love poker i love this yep. shit and this is happening but like oh man i need to i need to understand how to do to to sort out the mental side and deal with all the variants because the variance isn't gonna leave me it's gonna stay yep. and if anything monetary wise it's gonna get worse as i play higher stakes so i need to learn how to try and at least you don't have to eliminate like the negative things and be like okay i'm never gonna feel crap if i lose a ton of money well no you sort of it's gonna happen but like you need to understand how to resolve that issue you can't just like feel crap by it every time you know um you need to have some sort of mental stability and that's where as i've sort of said in this video you get your dopamine elsewhere so yeah. yeah awesome henry it's been a fascinating conversation i think people will take a lot from this 
and I wish you the best in all of your poker ventures from this point forward. It looks like you're you're headed in a good direction. So appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Pete. been a pleasure. Bye.